Not the amount of money. Um, uh, an agreement on a methodology to <laughs> to uh, to uh, uh, to fix that uh, amount. So I, I, I don't think that uh, uh, that is needed uh, from uh, day one to have an, uh, a negotiation about an amount. You, you need to uh, have a common understanding of what are the legal obligations are, and you, you need to have a, a, a common methodology on which you agree uh, to fix then uh, that uh, financial uh, settlement. What's your, what's your best case scenario though in terms of your preferred methodology as chair of the Brexit steering group? What kind of number would you think? It's a question about the methodology uh, and not about numbers. So you think it's fair then for David Davis to say he's not prepared to state a numerical value on this either? What we need from the British side is that, uh, uh, first of all, they recognise that there is a financial settlement needed. It's like in a divorce. In a divorce, when you go away, uh, you don't let uh, all the bills with uh, uh, with the rest of the family. That's not very serious. Secondly, uh, we need to, to have a common methodology how uh, to deal with this, how to fix it. And then, um, at the end, it, uh, it will produce a figure. So uh, that's the way uh, to go forward. That's also the reason, again, uh, I repeat it, that, that uh, we never, as a European Parliament, have launched uh, a, a figure. There are British Eurosceptic MPs who say that up until the point of departure there are financial obligations, but there's no provision in the treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, for any payments after that point of departure. Do you think there's any validity to that kind of claim? That depends completely of, uh, of what uh, will be our relationship after the departure. Uh, will there be a transition period, yes or no? I thought from the beginning that there, are, there is a necessity for a transition period because it's impossible in one year and a half not only to discuss and to debate and to negotiate a departure, but in, in top of that also the new relationship. That's not very realistic. So uh, what is this transition period? Uh, and if there is a transition period, are there also yeah, uh, financial obligations linked to the transition period? Secondly, uh, what will be the future relationship? And are there also financial obligations linked to their future relationship? What I think is not possible is to think, oh, we uh, want simply to continue uh, all the advantages uh, linked uh, to a membership of the European Union, the single market, the customs union, uh, things like that, without any obligation, uh, without uh, an oversight of the ECJ, without payments to the European budget, uh, without migration coming from Eastern European countries, and, uh, yeah, and, and without any competence by the Union on, on trade issues, uh, because we want to do it ourselves. Yeah, at the end, what, uh, what, what you establish then is uh, a, a system where a non-membership of the European Union is more, adva uh, is, 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 is more interesting than a membership of the Union. That cannot happen. Everybody will understand that uh, there has to be a difference. To be a member of the European Union means that you have a number of advantages that you don't have if you are not a member. Some people think or are dreaming that they could have all the advantages of the European Union, uh, free trade, single market, customs union, without any liability without any uh, inconvenience. Uh, no migration, no payments, no uh, oversight by the European Court of Justice and, and full authority on trade.